Let's look at First uh, Peter chapter 4, and as you're turning there, we are looking at prayer. We're finishing a series. We've been looking at Jesus in the school of prayer, teaching us how to pray. And we looked at all the positive ways he taught us to pray. Then we looked at the roadblocks, the, the hindrances, the reasons why sometimes our prayers are not answered. Today we're completing those. There are 15 of the roadblocks, and we've gone through all of them except the last one. And the last one I saved especially because it is written by the Apostle Peter right here in this little book. And, and the book of First Peter is the 21st book of the New Testament. If you uh, have trouble finding it, you just back up six books from the end, and, and it's a little book there. But Peter is the one that we're going to interview. But to do that, let's talk about prayer. Jesus is the ultimate authority on prayer. Jesus lived it, taught it. Jesus commended and commanded prayer. So he's the last word on prayer. But when I read Jesus on prayer, I think I could never, you know, arise a great while before day, stay up all night, walk on water, feed 5,000, raise the dead. You know what I mean? So we kind of feel, yes, we love Jesus, we know him, we'll be like him when we see him, but we don't feel like we could ever quite do what he did. And that's understandable, because he is God, the Son. But the person that knew Jesus best on earth gives us an insight which is very powerful. And that's Peter. Let me, let me interview Peter. This morning, one person has more to say about Christ praying than anybody else. One person more than anyone else in God's Word was an eyewitness to Jesus Christ's prayer life. His name, as I mentioned, is Peter. And Peter was the leader of the disciples. He was the chief of the apostles. And he was the man that was always out front. In fact, any time Jesus was anywhere, Peter's the kind of person that would kind of push his way to the front and just wanted to be up there by him. You ever met a person like that? They always are getting up near the front of the line. That's Peter's personality. Well, Peter was also one of the inner circle. Remember, Jesus had 70 that he sent out two by two, and then he had 12 that he called his disciples, and they became his apostles. And then within that, he had a select group of three, which were his inner circle. Peter was the leader of the innermost circle of Christ's followers. So Peter, I spent a week in close touch with this week. I read every word that he wrote and every word written about him. And Peter is monumental. Not only the inner circle, he was with Jesus in his most secret times of praying in the garden, earlier at the transfiguration, and Peter's insights are priceless. And so this morning I'd like to take you, starting in 1 Peter 4 and verse 7, through an interview of Peter. We're going to ask him four questions and ask him exactly what prayer should be in our lives and why he even comments on prayer and how we can learn from him. For this reason, Peter exceeds every other apostle in his exposure to Christ. He he talked more than any of the other disciples. Jesus speaks to him more than any of the other disciples. In fact, if you take all the words of all the disciples, they do not even equal the recorded words of Peter. He's just monumental in every way. In fact, next to our Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps Peter is the most well-known person in the New Testament. The Gospels are full of Peter, and so Peter's Gospel is our Gospel. It's etched on our heart as some of his most memorable words. And I just have to give these to you because I spent so long with Peter this week, his words just are on my mind. Think of these famous statements Peter makes. He said, depart from me, when he met Jesus at one time. I am a sinful man. What a profound statement. Lo, we've left all and followed thee. What will we have now? I mean, he he thought about that. Uh, How about this one? Be it far from thee. This shall never happen to you. Talking about the cross. I mean, talk about the apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. He was. Uh, Lord, if you bid me come to thee on the water, I will come. What did he say that, that quick right after? Lord, save me. As he started, you know, drowning beneath the Sea of Galilee. Here's another one. The crowd presses on you. How can you say, who touched me? And then his great confession. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Hmm. To whom can we go but unto thee? Thou hast the words of eternal life, Peter said. Lord, it's good for us here. Let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. I like this one. I could just see Peter's face when he said this one. Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? You know what he's going to say? 
probably thought the Lord would say three times, and he said, and I've already done it. You know, I mean, he was just that kind of guy, uh, you know, letting him know how good he was. Um, here's another one. He said to Jesus in front of everybody, Lord, you will never wash my feet. And what did he say an instant later? Lord, don't just wash my feet, wash my head, wash my hands. You see how tender, how transparent, how brash, and yet how intimate he was with Jesus. Then his classic statement, though all deny you, I will not. And then he says a breath later, I don't know that man. And denied Christ thrice. Well, how about asking this man, Peter, a few questions. And that's what I'd like to do with you this morning. Turn back with me to Matthew chapter 10. We're actually going to interview him. And I would encourage you to turn with me in these passages. The the Gospel by Matthew is the first one, chapter 10. And maybe, if you want to, note some things in your Bible. Because if you make marks or arrows or put little words in the margin, when you come across these passages... What happens with me is the very thing I learned at that point is reminded to me when I see little marks in my Bible. So I would encourage that as a little tool that you can use. But in our interview, we're going to ask this man who was at the front of every line that led to Jesus for three and a half years what he could share with us about Christ's prayer life and if he would have any warnings to us about how we can make sure that our prayers get through to God. Here's the first question. Peter How well do you know Jesus? Now, we would have to ask him that, because if he's going to tell us about Jesus, we'd have to say, now wait a minute, what are your credentials? How well do you know this man? And that's what we find in Matthew chapter 10. Let me read verse 2. And I'll preface reading this verse with saying, Peter is always listed in the inspired list God records in his word. Peter is always listed first every time. And I believe the Bible is supernaturally engineered, and I believe God picked every word, every place, every person in this book. And I think it's significant. Watch what I mean. Chapter 10, verse 2. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are, this is the first list mentioned in all of the scriptures. Here's the first list of the, of the apostles. First, verse 2 says, Simon, who is called Peter. Now, you'd say, well, maybe Matthew liked him, you know, old buddies. You know, they knew each other from Capernaum, so probably Matthew put him in first, okay? Well, let's turn to the next book. Go to the right to Mark's Gospel, chapter 3. The next Gospel over, the Gospel by Mark, chapter 3, and look at verse 13. Remember, every single list, same thing. Mark 3 and verse 13. And he went up, and this is the mechanics of that event, this is how Jesus picked the apostles. He went up on the mountain, and he called those to himself he wanted, and they came to him. And then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and have power to heal sicknesses and cast out demons. And here is the list. Look at verse 16. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. Again, and every time. Peter's first. Look at the next book. Go to uh, Luke. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 6. So the next gospel to the right, Luke 6, verse 12. It came to pass in those days, he went out in the mountain to pray. A little bit more. Jesus spent the whole night praying. In fact, Luke is preeminently recording the prayer life of Christ. Seven times he records Jesus' praise. Here's one of them. Jesus prayed uh, on this mountain, and he went in the mountain, and he continued all night in prayer to God. Verse 13. When it was day, he called his disciples to himself. Now look at this little extra, it says in verse 13. And from them he chose twelve. Now Luke tells us it wasn't just the twelve that were there. So Jesus summoned all of these followers that that had known him and loved him and had identified with him. And he summons them up there after a night-long prayer summit he had had with his Father in heaven and selects out of the larger multitude twelve individuals. Okay, but look at verse 14. This is the ones he chose to be named apostles. In verse 14, who is the first one mentioned? Simon, whom he also named Peter. Wow. Back up to Mark chapter 1. I want to show you something else really interesting. Mark's gospel, just back one book, chapter 1 and verse 16. Because Peter's not only first in every list, and I'm not going to do all the lists now because you can tell, and it's true. Every single one, he's front front and center. But Peter not only was the first in every list of the twelve, Peter is always first in the inner circle. I mean, he didn't just, just 
show up first in the roster. He showed up first when the team gathered. He's the one that always spoke for everybody else. He answered for them. When Jesus said, what do the apostles think? He answered. Now watch what it says in Mark chapter 1 and verse 16. Because Peter was first in the inner circle. And he was allowed into the most intimate and strategic places Jesus went. Verse 16, and as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother. So this is Jesus walking around that 13-mile-long, 7-mile-wide Sea of Galilee. And he's walking on the shore, and he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net. And this name of this net, it was a common, ordinary, 9-foot-wide casting net. And they were doing their thing, casting it out and pulling and, and doing that. And as Jesus went by them, verse 17, he said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And verse 18, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Look who he gets next. Verse 19, when he'd gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, and he calls them too. So here we find that inner circle, Peter, James, and John, who was first called? Peter. Who retained the first position? Peter. Who became front of the list? Peter. Okay, so Peter, how well do you know Jesus? Well, he says, I'm first. Well, now we'll go to Acts chapter 1, and that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. There we go, fifth book of the New Testament, Acts. That's the sequel to Luke. I always remember uh, when I witnessed to my um, sales trainer, when I was a salesman in seminary for American Home Products, I had this rough, tough uh, supervisor and you know how in sales you spend a lot of time at dinners and everything. And so I had witnessed to her over the months. And finally she said, okay, I'd like to know about your religion. And so I gave her, uh, I think the first thing I gave her was the, the gospel. And she said, wow, this is great. So then she wanted the New Testament. And after she read the New Testament, she said, isn't there a sequel to this? What she meant was the Old Testament, because it kept referring to books that weren't in the New Testament. Well, Luke has a sequel, which is Acts. In chapter 1, look at this, verse 9. Peter, I'm going to take you from 9 out of 14, always speaks for the 12. He was their spokesman even after the cross. After the resurrection, Peter retained this first place. Now I'm going to emphasize some words. Look at verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, that's Jesus, while they watched, so the, the apostles are watching, he, that's Jesus, was taken up in a cloud which received him out of their sight. And while they looked, verse 10, steadfastly toward heaven, he went up. And behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? These were angels speaking. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Verse 12, And when they returned to Jerusalem, to the mount called Olivet, which was near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Verse 13, here we go. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. And who is first now? What's the very next word? Peter. Now watch this. It's talking about the apostles. Verse 9, they watched. Verse 10, they looked. That's all the apostles. Verse 12, they returned. Verse 13, they entered this room. Verse 13 continues, they went up and they were staying there. And who represents them? Peter. Peter is the prime leader spokesman of the apostles. In summary... Peter is mentioned 160 times in the New Testament, in the Gospels almost 100 times. Peter speaks more often than any of the 12. He speaks more than all of them combined. He has more words recorded than anyone but Jesus. And Peter knows Jesus. Okay? Number two. As long as you're in Acts, go to chapter 6 with me. Okay? Remember I said Peter spoke for the apostles? Do you want to see him speaking for the apostles? Right here. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. Because Peter... Speaking for the apostles sums up what he saw. Okay? Now I'm going to show you in just a minute how he saw it. But look what he saw. He's speaking for the apostles and he says in Acts 6 and verse 4, But we, apostles, who knew Jesus, who walked with Jesus, who witnessed his, his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, here's one thing we caught from him. We will give ourselves... Uh, Very interesting word. We will continuously offer ourselves. We will constantly be in persevering readiness. In other words, we're going to be online all the time with him. We'll give ourselves to prayer. Well, Peter, what you knew Christ well. What did you learn from him? I'm going to give myself to prayer. Now, how did Peter learn all this? 
Turn back with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. And don't get tired of turning the pages. It helps uh, to actually see these things. We should not merely be hearers, but we should see this in our Bible and actually mark it so we can become doers of God's Word. But look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Because now we're asking Peter a third question. First we ask him, Peter, how well do you know Jesus? Peter, number two, what did Jesus teach you? He taught me to pray. But Peter, did you see Jesus praying? Is the third question I want to ask. Look at Mark 1.35. This to me, this is just such a graphic and beautiful passage. Verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out, this is Jesus, and departed into a solitary place. And there he prayed. So here's Jesus out in the quiet, bleak, desolate hills of Galilee probably. I mean, nothing, just the stillness as the sun is rising and he's out there in this very tranquil place of solitude. And guess what starts coming up the path? Hey, anybody seen Jesus? Where is he? I'm, wh- where is he? Jesus. I mean, do you see the next verse 36? And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. I mean, Jesus lived in those little four-room houses, which... We see all over Galilee today. And he was staying always in someone else's house. You ever stayed in someone else's house? You ever felt comfortable staying in someone else's house? I mean, how would you like a house with one bathroom and it's outdoors and there's four rooms and they're all connected and there's no glass? How would you like that? Would you be comfortable? And here's Jesus, spent three and a half years always with someone else, always in this closed-in setting, and he needed communion with his father. So Jesus, instead of lamenting and saying, oh, I never have time to pray and the phone rings all the time and my schedule is so busy and, you know, everybody's after me. What did he do? He got up early, went out to a quiet place. But look, who's leading the posse, the search party, to find Christ's secret place of early morning prayer? Peter. Why? He just wanted to be wherever Jesus was. He wanted to see him. He wondered what he was doing. Peter led the search party as they tried to find Christ's secret place. Now, look in chapter 9. You're in Mark's Gospel. Look at chapter 9. Go over to chapter 9 with me. Because Peter not only led the search party to see Jesus pray in his secret prayers, he took everybody with him, but Jesus also let Peter in on a very select moment. Chapter 9 of Mark's Gospel, verse 2. Now, after six days, this is the transfiguration of Jesus. This was a very intimate moment where momentarily the Father allowed the Son to pull back the veil of his flesh. Jesus had humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, but never ceased being God. And briefly, Jesus went like this and pulled back his flesh. And what came out? The divinity of God, the deity, it just glowed, the power of God. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now that was quite an event. Look at Mark 9. Six days after, after what? After the confession of Peter, the Tower of the Christ, and um, that big event. Verse 2 of Mark 9 says, Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and led them on a high mountain, and was transfigured before them. Whose name is first? Who got the inside look at Jesus? Peter. Back up to Matthew 17. Lest you think that this is a lucky hit on his part. Look at Matthew 17, the book before it. Matthew 17 and verse 1. After six days, same event, Jesus took who? Guess. Who do you think? Peter. So Peter, in, in Matthew 17 and Mark 9, the two records of the, of the transfiguration, was at the head of the line when Jesus was transfigured, when he pulled back the veil of his flesh, when he let his divinity flow out in all his glory. Peter was at the head of the line when Jesus was in secret praying in the early mornings. So Peter, do you know anything about Christ's prayer life? Yeah. I saw him out alone. I saw him in the hillsides. I heard his voice. I saw him. Peter, did did you ever see the Lord praying? Yes, I saw him when he was communing with his Father and glowing with all the glory unleashed of, of his eternal sonship. Wow. Do you see anything else, Peter? Yeah. You're in Matthew. Turn to Matthew 26 with me for just a moment. Matthew 26. This is one of the most intimate moments. This is amazing. And the... The way Jesus did it is amazing too. Matthew 26, look down at verse 36. Because Peter now he led the search party and was at the head of the line on Transfiguration Day, Peter was right at Christ's heels in the Garden of Gethsemane 
when Jesus prayed there intensely for hours. Look at verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, so what he did is he, he brought in the 12 minus 1, 11, because Judas had already gone off with the, to betray him. So the 11 were there, and Jesus sidelines eight of them. He takes them in this garden. He says, you guys park over there. Wait. And he says, no, no, you three, come with me. And, and look for this most intimate moment. Look what he says. Verse 36, at the end, sit over there, he said to the other eight. And verse 37, and he took with him Peter and the other two sons of Zebedee. Who? Peter. See, I think it's significant that the Bible records that Peter is the the mouthpiece of the apostles, that Peter is the one at the front of the line, that Peter is the one who got to experience everything. And so what Peter has to say about prayer is very important. Very important. We could go to Mark. It says the same thing in Mark 14, that Jesus took Peter. But... Let's turn now and conclude in 1 Peter 4 and verse 7. Okay, back where we started. Go to the 21st book of the New Testament, 1 Peter, and go to the 4th chapter with me, please. And we're going to end up in this book, okay? All this to say that if you want a blessing, you ought to study 1 and 2 Peter. Especially what I like about 1 and 2 Peter are the commands of Peter. Have you ever talked to someone about a meeting and say, oh, I wish I was been there because I, I, you know, I need to hear the person's voice and see their expressions to understand what they said? Well, the nice thing about the Greek language is that you can hear people's voice and understand their tone of their voice because in the Greek language, part of every Greek verb is the mode that it's given in. And it's given in many different types of modes, and one of the modes is called the imperative mode. And that is someone who is very excited, and they're raising their voice and and waving their arms, and they say, you need to really know about this. That's imperative. It's a command. It's something that you need to respond to. 1 Peter 4, 7 has two of 25 different imperatives that are in these five little chapters. Any of you looking for a neat study, you ought to look up the imperatives of Peter. But look at verse 7. This is what Peter said. At the end of his earthly life and ministry, he says, This is the priority I would exhort and command you to have. He says, I was the leader of the twelve. I always pushed and nudged my way to get nearest to Jesus. I was the voice of the apostles. And these are my last words to you before I depart and be with the Lord. I knew him in the flesh. You will never get to walk with him in the flesh during his earthly ministry like I did, Peter said. These are my parting words to you if you want to know how to make it. Verse 7 of chapter 4. But the end of all things is at hand. He said, my end, I'm almost ready to fold up my tent and go home. And he said, the end of the world. By the way, Second Peter 3 is the end of the world. So Peter had a dual focus here. He's talking about the end of all things, prophetically and personally. And he says, I'm leaving and the world is going to end. And he said, in the interim between my departure and the world ending, here's what's most important for you. This is what you need to be involved in. Verse 7. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Wow, Peter, what should we be doing? Serious and watchful. Serious? What does that mean? It means we should be energized and and engaged in prayer. Watchful? What does that mean? Watch out for roadblocks. There are things that are going to stop your prayers from getting through. And that's what I want to end with. Back up one chapter, and this is where we're going to end. Look at chapter 3, verse 7. Because Peter gives us the 15th, the final roadblock to prayer. The, The 15th, the final reason why our prayers that we offer don't go through at times. You know what Peter says? He says, the way that you live at home and the condition of your home and especially the condition of your marriage determines how well your prayers get through. Look at verse 7 of 1 Peter 3. This is what Peter says. Husbands, Likewise, So there, men are responsible for all the details of the first six verses. In the same manner as I've already attributed to the wives, he says, Husbands, dwell with them, that is your wife, with understanding... 
That's the first element. Giving honor to the wife as a weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Hmm. Well, I thought that was interesting, and I spent so long this week reading it, and I thought, well, what does hindered mean? Does it mean that you don't feel like praying or, or what? Well, you know what the word, Peter was very graphic. The word here that he used is the word ekkopto, which is a Greek word which means nothing to you unless you look it up in a dictionary. And this is what it says. To cut off, to hew down, to cut down, to cut out. It's like cutting a tree or a branch of a tree off. You know what he's saying? He's saying if things are not right in your home, if there is not a spiritual atmosphere in your Christian home, if you do not initiate and cause the devotion of Christ to be a part of your marriage and your family, your prayers will be cut off. That's what he says. I didn't say that. I'm glad I didn't say it. That's a very profound thing to say, Peter. Okay, real quickly. What things cause that roadblock to occur? He lists four. Number one, in verse 7, he says, dwell with them. Peter wrote to Christian husbands and reminded them of four areas they're responsible for in their relationship with their wives, which is going to impact their prayers. And and let me just read to you what one uh, uh, pastor preaching on this 20 years ago wrote, and I just love him. He's so practical. He said, this implies dwelling with them much more than sharing the same address. Marriage is fundamentally a physical relationship. Ephesians 5 says the two become one, and a truly spiritual husband will fulfill his duties to love his wife. How do you do that? Well, this guy is great. He said this, a husband needs to make time to be home with his wife. He said, and this is in the 70s, a survey recently revealed that the average husband and wife spent 37 minutes a week together in actual communication. Communication is creating understanding. You know what Bonnie says to me all the time? I wish she would say it less and less, but you know what she says? She says, you didn't tell me that, you just thought that. You know what, I think all the time, and I, I, in my mind I'm talking it over with Bonnie, and I just talk it over with her endlessly, but I never actually went around the sharing. By the way, we're having people come over on, uh, you know, 400 people come over. <laughs> I thought about it for a long time and sent the invitations, but, uh, but we should dwell with them according to knowledge. Is it any wonder that marriages fall apart after the children grow up and leave home because the husband and wife are left alone and they find they're strangers living in the same house? They have not built the firm foundation that comes to a marriage where communication is normal and practiced in an everyday basis. Well, we should dwell with them physically. It's not anything less than a daily desire we have to communicate and create understanding with our husband and wife. But secondly, he goes on. Look what he says in verse 7. He says, dwell with them, secondly, according to knowledge. This, this speaks not only of the physical relationship, but the intellectual relationship. I always like the story, uh, Mrs. Albert Einstein was asked, remember when he was at Princeton, he wrote out all of his unified field theory, and they used to, when Einstein would write on the blackboard, as soon as he turned to write on the next one, they sh- they'd spray it with shellac, haul it out, and put a new one up, because... What he wrote was so profound, they didn't want him to erase it. And so someone came up to Mrs. Einstein and says, Do you understand the unified field theory of your husband's? She says, No, but I understand Albert. Now you see, you don't need to know the theory of relativity to be great. You need to know your husband or wife. You need to intellectually know them. Uh, In premarital counseling as a pastor, I often give couples a pad of paper, and I say, write down the three things that you think your soon-to-be partner would enjoy the most. And I'll tell you what, the, the ladies go just like this, bam, bam, bam. They write them down, and they'll hand it to me. And the guy will be sitting there going, and he has nothing. Never think. Men do not think about what their wife would love the most. They know what they would like. They don't know anything about them. Self-centered. And we have to work at that. How can a husband show consideration for his wife if he doesn't understand her needs, her problems? If you ever hear your husband or wife say, I never knew you felt that way, it's a confession that at one time or another you excommunicated each other Because when either mate is afraid to be open and honest about their life, they're building walls. And you know what what Peter says here? Dwell with them according to knowledge. Just ask them all kinds of questions. What do you like about this? What do you like about that? How come you like this? Do you like that? What's your favorite this? And then remember them and build on that. 
It's a lifelong process. And it shouldn't be forced, because if you love someone, you want to know them. Thirdly, see what he says in verse 7? Number one, physically dwell with them. Number two, intellectually have it according to knowledge. Number three, emotionally give honor to the wife. You know, chivalry may be dead, but every husband should be the knight in shining armor who treats his wife like a princess. A husband should treat his wife like an expensive and beautiful, fragile vase. Boy, that dates it. No. How about treating her like an expensive and beautiful and fragile laptop or PDA? Or how about a Lexus, you know? And that's more our style, our society. You know, I, I watch the way men carry around their electronic things. And they, you know, some with their satellite radio, they slip it into their case. They don't want anything to hurt that, you know. And they're going to slip it in the holder at their office or their laptop they put into that. I mean, I wish they would show as much concern and love and care and value for their partner as they do for their PDAs. You know what I mean? It's amazing. How he says, give honor to them. You know, a guy is dating a girl, and he treats her courteously and thoughtfully. They get engaged. He's more courteous and thoughtful, and they get married, and he forgets how to be courteous and thoughtful. And that's the sad human nature we have. Happiness in a home is made up of little things. Big resentments often grow from small hurts. Giving honor means the husband respects his wife's feelings, her thinking, her desires. He may not agree with her ideas, but he respects them and even more her. And even though God says the husband should be the thermostat of the home, setting the emotional and more importantly the spiritual temperature, the wife is always the thermometer. Who knows what's going on in the house? And we should honor her for that. Finally, look at the end of verse 7. The spiritual realm. Physically, intellectually, emotionally, lastly, spiritual. That your prayers be not hindered. Now, what I like about this is, you notice he doesn't command that you pray in your marriage. He assumes it. Did you catch that? He didn't say, you should be praying together. He said, that your prayers be not hindered. It it is foundational to a Christian marriage that there is a Christian dimension to that marriage, that husbands pray with their wives. I just, a moment ago, was standing with one of the men in the church and washing my hands, and I said, how are you doing it, praying with your wife? He said, that's what? You caught me in in here, and you're going to ask me a question like that? I said, how are you doing with praying with your wife? That is that is understood as a part of the package. It is a part of being a Christian that the breath of prayer pervades every part of our life, especially our marriage. A husband and wife need to have their own private individual prayers, but they also need to pray together and to have a time of devotion to Christ as a family. How this is organized, there is no law about that, but the word of God and prayer are the basic foundational stones to a happy home and a holy home. How can you raise children that will love and honor and follow and submit to God if you do not honor and love and submit to one of the basic building blocks, which is a shared spiritual devotion to Christ as a couple? You'll never transfer that to kids if you don't practice it yourself. Well, Peter says... Watch out, the physical part of your marriage will hinder your prayers, the intellectual part of your marriage, the emotional part of your marriage, because he said the greatest part of your marriage is the spiritual, and your prayers will be hindered. Well, Peter, you who are in the front of every list, uh, what do you have to say about prayer? He said, I'm going to devote myself to prayer and the ministry of the word. And Peter, we're going to interview you. What's the last thing you want to say about prayer? He says, I want you to devote yourself to prayer. But watch out. In one of the most fundamental parts of life, your family. If your family life is not God-honoring, if you do not invite the Lord into your relationship as a couple, if you as a man do not initiate and sanctify and cleanse your wife with the washing water by the word and surround her with prayer, then your prayers about everything else are going to be ek kapto, chopped off. Just like me, I was out Bazooka Joe edging, and the edger stopped. I cut my own cord off. (laughs) You know what? A lot of people are out there, and they've got the edger of ministry going, and the power cord's cut off. And they're just happily just edging along, and they cut their own cord off. We should give ourselves to prayer. But to realize the final roadblock of prayer is, if our family life's not right, 
the cords cut. Let's bow before the Lord and ask for Him to speak to our hearts what He wants us to do in our lives. Father in Heaven, I thank You that we can go through uh, the school of prayer with You, O Christ, and these weeks have been such a blessing, but our hearts have been stirred to think that there are roadblocks that You warn us of. And I pray that more than just hearing all this and jotting a note here and there and tucking it away till next time, that we would make a choice right now as husbands that we're going to initiate spiritual things in our home and as wives that we are going to respond and not criticize and not belittle and not make fun of but encourage those men that you've put in our lives that know you and that we will realize that our prayers come right down to home and if there's something wrong at the heart of our home our prayers are hindered and I pray we'd realize that we need to go back and realize that Christian life is nothing more nothing less than a series of new beginnings and if there has been any failure be it a day, a month, a year, or a decade, that we can just start over today. You're the God of the second and third and fourth and fifth and thousandth chance. And you love us, and you forgive us, and you receive us back. And I pray that many marriages in this room would today make the choice that they do not want their prayers hindered. And I pray for some men to be bold enough to initiate again you, O oh Lord, and some wives bold enough to encourage their husbands and some children to long for hearing their father and mother talking about you. And Lord, we pray that we will be great men and women of God, communing with you in prayer as Peter exhorts us to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.